Today on Financial Markets Microstructure we will be talking about high frequency trading. So as usual, a quick reminder of what happened last week, if you managed to forget it all. Uh, last week we talked about how liquidity interacts with corporate governance, how intrafirm decisions uh, are intertwined with what happens in financial markets, so outside the firm. And we covered, we touched a lot of different bases in how these things can happen. And we also quickly glanced through um, uh, digital markets and the topics of how the global dig digitization and uh, globalization and centralization and all that, computerization is the word that I've been looking for, how all that has transformed digital markets, how that has transformed market interactions. And we saw that a lot of, a lot of uh, changes were for the better. They typically improved transparency, they improved um, liquidity, they improved... Um, they reduced trading costs, I guess is the bottom line here. And we also talked a little bit about um, the relatively recent uh, trendy topic of cryptocurrency and blockchain. And we saw that they have their uses, but um, they might have been a little over-advertised. So today, as I told you, we'll be talking about high-frequency trading, but before that we have a couple of um, other things that I wanted to talk about. And first comes our, I guess, now regular section, Tales from the Market. In particular, let us talk about what happened uh, this Monday. I'm, I'm sure all of you know what happened this Monday, so I won't even uh, tell you what it's about, but what what, what it was, but um, you know, wh why did it happen? Why did it happen? What could lead to such a horrible, horrible thing? Okay, I'm trolling. Of course I'll tell you what happened this Monday. Uh, this is what happened this Monday. So what you see in the graph is um, intraday price for the crude oil futures, one month uh, forward future contracts. And if you see the price uh, in this graph, this is not a dash right here, it's a minus. So it's minus $37 per barrel. This is the price at which oil futures were traded on Monday. Uh, and so for those of you who are already awakened here, I have a quick quiz. How could this possibly happened? have happened? Why are these negative prices, where did they come from? What was this due to algorithmic trading? As we talked last time, uh, there are many, many cases in which algorithms screwed up. Or, you know, was it just a price that somebody posted as a joke and no one actually traded at that price? Or, you know, was it uh, was this actually the price at which strategic human traders trade it. Uh, have some think about it and let me know. I did this in the wrong order again. There should also be a timer showing, but I've had some problems with it today. So, um, we have people split between two and three. Uh, it was actually three, so uh, contracts were traded at this price, but this was not an algorithm failure. So this was not one of those flash crashes that we talked about last time around. It was actually the price at which um, uh, traders traded all of their uh, stock. Now, I'm definitely no expert in that, uh, but from what I read from the more knowledgeable people, and the, my understanding is that... Um, uh, how do I say this? 
So there is some US oil fund and it has a lot of open positions in oil futures and it does roll these positions over every month. So there is a huge predictable trade happening every month in these uh, forward future contracts. And so a lot of traders are um, I forgot the word there uh, running ahead of these contracts so they're doing the same trade as is as, as is anticipated uh, before this rollover and when the rollover happens they actually cancel their position with this huge rollover done by the USO fund and so they uh, profit off of this and but all of these are all of these traders are who forward who run ahead of the train are speculators so they actually cannot they do not plan for actual physical delivery and they need to cancel out their positions they need to unravel their positions eventually and uh, apparently there were too many of them this time around so some of them had to unravel at very very negative prices so that is my very uh, amateurish explanation of what happened uh, I'll post a blo blog post written by someone who knows the stuff better than me on Epsilon. If anything, I think I have already posted this on Epsilon. So you can go there and read it and get a slightly better understanding of what happened. But yeah, this uh, is one of the very few, if any, incidents where we actually get to see the negative price in uh, in the market. So that's pretty cool. Now, of course, I understand that this is a commodity market. It's not a 100% financial market, but I think it's uh, it's very close to our topic. So I wanted to discuss that. Okay. So this is a very curious case. Another thing that I wanted to talk about is um, talk a little more on algo trading and algorithmic trading, just in general. Not necessarily in relation to high-frequency trading. And uh, the reason I wanted to revisit this is because I attended one of one online seminar uh, yesterday and uh, I found the paper being presented there very, 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 very relevant to what we're doing. So uh, here's a quick, very brief introduction to that paper. So this is a pap paper by Beeson and Wahal and it was out since December 2019, apparently, but I only heard about it yesterday. So, in general, the, the, the uses of algorithmic trading that I announced to you last time around were um, a couple, right? So there are a couple of things that we can use algorithms for. One is, of course, high-frequency trading, and we will talk about that a little later today. So the way we think about high-frequency trading is that um, Well, it's used by basically arbitrageurs or by all of these professional for-profit traders who really, really, really want to get their money no matter what. Uh, and in general, I told you that this is that these evil for-profit people are probably not the only ones who use algorithms. And um, larger, you know, institutional, less active traders maybe even retail traders can still use algorithms to, for example, um, get some insurance or provide hedge uh, through some automated um, algorithmic trades. But one thing that I did not mention last week and that we'll talk about today is that algorithms also allow for better execution of orders. Meaning when you now want to trade uh, to acquire or unravel some large position you no longer need to split the order yourself into many uh, smaller orders because you know you want to stagger it over time you may want to split this order across different exchanges to um, have smaller of a total price impact right so now you no longer need to do it yourself you can let the algorithm do it for you and so what um, these guys do in this paper is they got some data 
from, I believe, a um, brokerage company, which actually executed a lot of those trades. And um, they get to see how these algorithms work. So they looked at uh, four, some pretty standardized algorithms that they claim is widely in use in the real world. And um, so these algorithms are typically used by these large institutional investors. So the, what we call uninformed traders, right? And so the value of this, of this uh, paper is to say that, you know, the way we usually model the uninformed traders, that they just submit their order no matter what, may lo no longer be appropriate in our modern world. Because these uninformed traders are still very sophisticated. They trade in very sophistic sophisticated ways using these algorithms. So, you know, maybe we need to change our models. So for terminology, uh, we'll say that an institutional investor submits some big parent order to the brokerage firm. And this parent order is split into many child orders by the algorithms. So child orders are the orders that the algorithm submits to the market. And um, here I have few of the more of the remaining bliss quizzes. So I, I did not get to incorporate many of those. Uh, it was a bit short on time, but we'll have a couple more today. So try to guess how this splitting works. So what is what are the statistics that it produces? And if you're looking at the slides, then no peeking. So average parent order uh, attempts to trade oh, a, a bit shy of $300,000 over 84 minutes total. So these are significant, but not very huge orders. Uh, so there might be already some splitting happening on the uh, on the parent side. And just in terms of volume, this is equivalent to about 5% of the volume over the duration of the order. So 5% of market volume is actually quite significant. So these uh, these traders are are um, composing quite a significant share of the market. So I didn't have time to read too carefully. Uh, I, I think that the, they got data from just one brokerage firm, so I'm not sure uh, if this 5% applies to traders who trade through this brokerage firm or they have somehow extrapolated to the whole market. But first question to you. How much splitting do you think happens on this algorithm side? So how many child orders do you think every parent order spawns? I forgot to put the numbers here. But yeah, this is quick. Quick guess. I will not even start the music. Give me your guesses. How much splitting happens? So we have a few answers that, uh, in favor of the last option and one answer for 20 to 50. But the last option is actually correct. So on average, each parent produces 63, what they call the runs, so 63 groups of orders. And each run produces, about, has about, sorry, nine children. So that's a total of, um, what, 500 something uh, child orders per parent order. And that's kind of what I meant when I was told that uninformed traders are getting quite sophisticated. So... Yeah, this... Any, any given single market order is now sp split very heavily 
into child orders and um, even uninformed traders are trying to minimize their market impact. Now there is another uh, bit of inconsistency or misunderstanding on my side. So they say that each order um, is being attempted to be executed over about 10 minutes. So on average, these runs run about 10 minutes in total. I, I'm not sure I quite understand how it relates to these 84 minutes that they also claim. Um, my guess is that these 84 minutes are on the parent side, so this is how long the the investor is trying to execute this um, order for. So they give up after 84 minutes on average. They give up or they fill their order. And um, 10 minutes is how long the algorithm tries to do it for. But I don't really know. So you, you are welcome to actually go and give this paper a read. It's quite an easy read and it's mostly just statistics. So they have a lot of curious stats and all of this. If you're interested, go ahead and give it a read. But I have another question for you in the meanwhile. Just for another uh, wild guess at statistics. What do you think is the composition of, across market orders and limit orders in this child order? So, in particular, what is the share of child orders that are market orders? Okay, in the text work. I guess it does depend on, on the order in which I press the buttons. It's one, two, one, two, one. And close call, but it's actually one. Of all those 300 million child orders in their sample, less than 0.4 of a percent are market orders. So that's actually something quite, quite crazy. Um, and this is even more interesting when you compare it with um, other class of uninformed investors that we usually look at, which is retail investors. Because they use market orders about 50% about of the time, or over 50% of the time. So, you know, maybe, maybe we should think of... Maybe we should really look differently at these different kinds of uninformed investors. Maybe retail investors are very, 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 very different from these large institutional investors, even though both are uninformed. So, for um, for these large traders, about 80% of the orders are limit orders, and whatever is left are um, what's called peg orders. So, these are also a special class of limit orders, but uh, they're price is dynamically pegged, so it's tied to uh, the national best bid and offer, or basically to the market mid-price. So peg orders say that uh, I'm willing to buy at a price equal to mid quote minus a dollar, something like that, and vice versa. I'm willing to sell at a market mid quote plus one dollar. So these are also uh, quite popular, as it turns out. And of the limit orders, um, about a quarter is marketable and two-thirds are passive and the rest are inside the spread. Now this is a classification that we have not actually seen before, uh, so let us take a quick look at that. Because I feel like this is something worth knowing. So, 
uh, that's our standard ugly picture. We have one axis, which is the price. We have a bid and ask, and everything between them is the spread. So the way we usually think, or the way we thought about limit orders in this course is, when you submit a limit order, you either undercut... So suppose you want to buy something, right? So you're submitting a bid. Uh, how do you do it? You either undercut the best bid by a little bit, and you submit an order somewhere here, or you take a larger ex execution risk and you submit somewhere below the best bid. So we never really thought that, we never really looked at cases where you might want to submit your order well inside the spread, but this is something you can actually do. Moreover, you can actually submit an order above the best ask, which would kind of lead to your order being executed automatically, right? Because you're willing to buy at a price that is slightly above what um, other traders are willing to sell at. So there is profitable trade and it should be executed immediately. And so these are what is called marketable limit orders. So those that are supposedly um, those that create this overlap, this crossing. And uh, the limit orders that we looked at in our course are called passive limit orders. So going back to the classification, about a quarter of all orders are marketable. So they are kind of almost equivalent to market orders, right? But they are not exactly market orders. They fill the same role, but they are slightly different in, uh, in execution, in how they are executed. And uh, only two thirds of the orders are of all limit orders are passive. So another th statistics that uh, this paper provides is that many orders are unfilled, even when limit orders are marketable. So even when there is this overlap, when it exists, your order might not get executed. This may happen for a variety of different reasons. Uh, it may happen because you submitted a dark order and there were some visible orders that uh, outbid you almost immediately. Or it might be because you requested some uh, minimal volume to be traded at this price, so you told the exchange that this order is not to be filled unless uh, is not to be partially filled, but say it's all or nothing, or impose some other lower bound on how much you're willing to buy. And in that case, it might be the case that uh, this best ask uh, has s uh, less units than your lower bound. So in this case, there is no overlap. So a question in chat, what is the advantage of marketable limit order compared to market order? I've been waiting for this question. Uh, and this is a very reasonable one to ask, right? So why should why would you use one and not another? So the thing about market orders is that they might be held for some time by the uh, by the market maker if there is you know physical market maker here in the market or market order may um, so market order I guess might be subject to very swift price changes so if you're not confident that by the time your order reaches the market, the price will still be this. And you know, there is a slight risk, as you think, that um, the price will go 
somewhere here. Then once your market order reaches the market, it will execute at this price. You don't want that, right? So in that case, this limit order provides, provides some kind of insurance. It gives you an upper bound on the price at which you're willing to execute, which ensures you a little bit against these very sudden price shocks. Yes, I guess in chat you will at maximum pay the marketable buy limit order price, whereas a standard market order has the risk of paying a higher price. Exactly, yes. So exactly what I uh, just said. So yeah, very good. Um, in a sense, marketable limit order is a safer version of a market order. So it has implicit insurance in, in it. Yeah, but I guess uh, here is the difference, another difference. Um, this insurance comes at a cost. So even if your limit order is marketable, it may go unfilled. So you are incurring some execution risk, even with a marketable limit order. Now, to give you a sense of the speed, uh, conditional on the order being filled, conditional on it being traded, the median time to trade is 5 milliseconds. That's how quickly the limit order book moves. Orders are not staying in the book for longer than 5 milliseconds. This is... I think this is crazy. Um, yeah. And another fun fact is that even the unfilled orders have some price impact. So when we were uh, talking about price impact, we thought about market orders having some price impact, right? But limit orders, we never really thought about them as revealing some information. We never thought about them. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll correct myself. Um, in parlor model, we had a glimpse of uh, how they could have had price impact. So, if any of you can remember parlor model, um, there we had something like this. So this is private valuation uh, of a trader. And they submit different orders depending on this private valuation. Uh, if it's very high, they submit a market order to buy. If it's somewhat high, they submit a limit, limit order to buy, limit sell, and um, market sell. So in that model, we did not have any price impact because uh, this was purely private valuation. It did not contain any information about um, the fundamental value of the asset. But if you uh, can it transition this same idea into this private information world, into thinking that, well, traders, uh, traders decide which order to submit based on their private information, you will kind of get the same idea, more or less. But then the limit orders will also have some price impact. They will indicate that the trader might have some minor but, um, but good private information. They think that fundamental value V is a little higher than the currently assigned than currently thought by the market and vice versa limit order to sell would be a mild negative signal about the fundamental value so limit orders could be informative in that world uh, that we never looked at and so the curious case is that even unfilled orders so those that were posted and then cancelled they have price impact if I, if I read the paper correctly, I think this price impact was um, even larger for unfilled orders. 
then it was for field orders. So this I have no explanation for. And um, yeah, to get another sense of scale, this price impact was on the scale of seconds at most. So the, this price impact existed within a second, it was relatively small, 5 or 10 seconds after the trade. So that's that's how fast markets are these days. Once again, uh, that's really just a very, very quick survey. Um, very, very quick reinterpretation of the paper, because I only saw it 20 hours ago. Uh, you should totally go read it. It's really cool. It gives you an idea of how markets work today. And with that, I don't know why I had two of these slides. With that, we are moving to high frequency trading. Unless you have some, um, unless you have some questions on what we just covered, because I guess it's a good split. Okay, let's say there are none. Uh, so for high frequency trading, I guess one word of introduction before we go into that. Uh, from this point onwards, we will pretty much exclusively be dealing with research papers. So we do not have the textbook anymore. All of the narrative will be based on papers. I do hope that slides will be clear enough even if my narrative won't be, uh, but you may be willing, it's completely normal, uh, you might be willing to refer to the original papers as well at some points. So they may vary in how easy they are to read, uh, but the general approach towards reading research articles, if you've not done it before that much, uh, especially theoretical ones. So with the survey articles that I've given you so far, uh, today and last week, those are pretty much plain text. They are like a book. You read them beginning to end, and, and that's it. But for theoretical ones, they usually contain a lot of excessive... Um, yeah, a lot of excess information that you do not necessarily need to get the main idea. So how you approach them is uh, you start by reading abstract and introduction, to get the general idea of what this paper is about. And so this is uh, if you're doing reading on your own. But in relation to papers that we'll cover in class, I hope that lectures will kind of substitute at least some part of these abstract and the introduction. Then you quickly browse through the rest to get an idea of what what is the general contents of the paper, just to bird's eye view of what's in there. And the most important parts that you actually need to read carefully are model setup, because you need to understand what exactly went into the making of the sausage, what assumptions are made in the model, and uh, if authors are particularly honest, they might even tell you what the drawbacks of their assumptions are, so why these are good or bad assumptions, why these assumptions are good or bad. And once you've done that, uh, you go to the results. So quite often the formal statements of the results, theorems and propositions, they might not be as informative as the surrounding discussion. Because they just contain too much math, they... Um, in a sense that they have 15 different variables within one statement, and... Um, if you're not reading the paper carefully, you probably don't remember what these variables mean. So, but if you read the surrounding discussion, the, the text around the results, then many authors will explain informally what this result means, what is the essence, what is the big point of a given result. And um, after that, 
to just fix the big idea about the paper, you read the conclusion, and you revisit the abstract and introduction with the new context behind them. So now you know how the model looks like, now you know how the results look like, so you can... It's good to refresh the knowledge of how authors interpret the big picture behind these results, and these big pictures usually contain abstract and introduction. So that's a bit of a methodological note, and um, this is a small intro to HFT. I guess we've done a lot of it earlier today and uh, last week, but to reiterate, so HFT refers to computerized algorithmic trading at very high, high pace, and we just saw how high that pace is, and it's really prominent lately. Once again, we just saw that even the you know, uninformed traders are using it these days, and uh, if you're thinking about uh, more informed traders, more professional traders, those whose life is the market, they are definitely using a lot of HFT. So it's so valuable in particular that um, they are willing to incur a large, very large cost, very large expenses to get that speed advantage, to decrease their latency to market. And I mentioned last time around this popular case when a whole new internet cable was laid between Chicago and uh, New York, New Jersey just to cut a couple of milliseconds off the latency, I guess it's clear, for Chicago traders to NASDAQ, to New York exchanges. So the number that I've not given you up to now is that high-frequency trading is estimated to account for over 50% of, of all trading volume in the US. So whenever you're trading, you're trading against HFT more often than not. It's a bit less widespread in Europe, but it still, it still accounts for more than 25% of the trade in Europe. Now it's a relatively recent phenomenon, uh, so while the traders have been using it for what, 10, 15, maybe 20 years, um, the academia moves very very slowly, so we're still not quite certain uh, from the scientific, so to say, point of view, what is the effect of high-frequency trading on the market? So, should we really allow these traders to spend 300 million bucks on um, this cable to get some profit? Or should we try to regulate HFT? And if so, how do we do it? So today we'll look at a couple of theoretical papers. Well, I guess one of them is half-theoretical, half-empirical. So we'll look at a couple of models that try to investigate this question. And they mostly look at well yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not quite sure what the thought there was, but uh, I guess they mostly look at these informed traders. So the paper that we just discussed uh, is really new in that is really novel in that it's one of the few that actually looks at the uninformed traders uh, using HFT, which is not something we thought about before. So, okay, uh, two papers. Let's start the first one a little bit before the break. Uh, so this is a paper that was published in 2015. I think the second was also published in 2015. So just like 85 for the original models, uh, 2015 was a good year for HFT models. So this is a paper by Bie. I guess I, that's how the surname is pronounced. Uh, Foucault, that we all know and love, and uh, Moina. Maybe I should not try to pronounce French names. Uh, so this model develops a very simple model of fast trading and uh, endogenous choice of trading speed. So it tries to really get to the core concept of what is the advantage of fast trading and uh, what are the optimal, what are the investments that traders are willing to take in order to become fast. So this model goes as follows. We have a continuum of profit-maximizing institutions. 
uh, they all have zero endowment, they have one unit. It's a three period model and we begin by looking at the last two periods. So forget there is period zero for now. Let's say there are two periods, one and two. Asset value for each trader is given by UI, which is composed of um, the fundamental value V and the idiosyncratic component YI. So it combines kind of both approaches to heterogeneous valuations uh, that we've seen so far. Uh, we're gonna take a very, very, very simple, very binary version of this model. So we'll say that the fundamental value V can be high or low. So given that ex ante market valuation is mu, the true value V is either epsilon above or epsilon below this mu. This happens with equal probability. And well, at the very end, everyone gets to, re uh, gets to learn this V and uh, get the payoff connected to this V. The private value is also binary. It's either high or low. We will say it's high if it's delta, it's negative, uh, it's low if it is minus delta. It's also equal probability, it's in independent uh, across traders, and it's independent of the fundamental value V. But all investors get to observe their YI before they trade. So it's observed at the beginning of period one. Trading in this model occurs at, uh, I guess, at the end of period one. The, it, it, it's always difficult to work with these one, two period models because there is still a lot of timing within these periods. But trading occurs at the end of period one after everyone knows why I. But when at least some traders still do not know the V. I'm saying some because we will have two kinds of traders. So we'll have fraction alpha of the institutions that will make an investment at this period zero to become high frequency traders. And in this first part of our analysis, we'll take this alpha as given. So we will analyze periods one and two, and then we'll look at uh, these optimal investment decisions. So we'll call these uh, HFT traders fast institutions. So those who invest will become fast. And those who do not invest remain slow. This is our labeling for today. Uh, the speed gives you two advantages in this model. One advantage is that you get to learn V before the other traders. So fast institutions get to learn V before they trade. So they learned at the beginning of period one. And slow institutions do not get to do it. So they do not know V unless un, until after the trades conclude. So the idea behind this assumption is that, um, well, slow, uh, smaller latency gives you more information, right? Because you can submit your order later and it will arrive to the market at the same time. And the later you submit your order, um, kind of the more information you will get from the meanwhile. So if this is time and you want the order to be executed at this time, uh, if you are a slow trader, you'll have to submit the order somewhere here because this is the latency. The large latency that you have while an HFT, a fast trader, can submit this order somewhere here. So they have smaller latency, they can submit the order better. So the fast trader will know everything that has happened during this time. So you can think that V is somehow realized during this period. So slow traders do not get to observe V 
at the point that they submit the order, while the fast traders will have seen V when they submit their order. So this was one advantage of speed. You get to learn the fundamental value. Another advantage is um, you get to find a trading opportunity with a higher probability. So fast institutions find a trading opportunity with probability one, while for slow institutions, this is not guaranteed. So the chance that they will find a trading probability, trading opportunity is a row and it is strictly lower than one. Now this assumption is a little more difficult for me to justify. Uh, why, why can speed um, give you trading opportunity with a higher probability? I guess it is also the case uh, that you get to see more of the limit order book if you submit your order at a later date. And this increases your chance of uh, seeing a lucrative trading opportunity. So this is, um, in a very reduced form, a search model. And we've seen one or two of those before. So to clarify the timing, we've seen all of it already, I think. Uh, in period zero that, again, we're not looking at yet, institutions decide whether to invest in speed or not. Then in period one, everyone observes their YI. And if they are fast, they also observe V. Then everyone um, does or does not find a trading opportunity. And if they do, they decide how to trade. So they choose whether to buy, sell, or abstain. So what kind of order to submit to the market. And here we are back again to our very simple toy world where everyone submits market orders to a dealer, to a market maker. And uh, this centralized dealer or market maker executes all orders at, um, at the expected value. So liquidity providers are competitive, dealers are competitive, and they trade at zero profit. So they um, buy or sell you at exactly the expected value of the asset conditional on the order, conditional on the information contained in the order. All right, so. Uh, yeah, we'll call good news and bad news this private information about V that fast institutions um, will have when they trade. So to characterize the equilibrium, we need to describe how all agents behave, right? So we already told you, I already told you how liquidity providers behave, so they are not, in a sense, part of the strategic part of the model, will not uh, tell how they trade in equilibrium but to describe an equilibrium we need to uh, say how exactly will fast institutions trade given any combination of private information that they might have and how will slow institutions trade given any kind of private information that they might have so to do, to do that we need to first uh, list what are the kinds of private information that both of these types of agents might have Slow institutions only know YI, so their YI is either high or low, it's either delta or minus delta, and we'll denote these respective types by H and L. And for fast institutions, they know both YI and they know V. So they know whether the news were good or bad, and they know whether, whether their private valuation is high or low. So they are they will have one of four possible types, depending on the combination of these signals. So let's get, let's get to solving this model. Now, does this model remind you of 
anything that we've seen so far. Because to me, it does look very similar to one of the models that we've seen so far. So to me, it reminds a lot of the Gloston Milgram model. Well, you'll say, there we had informed and uninformed investors, and here everyone kind of gets to learn V. But here it's, it's kind of the same, right? So here some traders know V when they are submitting the order, and some traders do not. So it is almost the same model. We have some informed traders, we have some uninformed traders. And we have competitive dealers in the middle. And that's it. So the only, the only significant kind of difference here is that traders also have this uh, private valuation element, Y, YI. Um, so this is to make trade of the uninformed traders a little, a little more microfounded. So we can solve this model more or less like we do Gloss and Milgram model. In particular, if alpha is zero, if there are no fast traders in the market, this would mean that nobody knows V at the time of trading, and so all orders will execute at the mid quote. The order flow will be completely uninformative. So that's the good but kind of boring case, and let's suppose that alpha is positive, so there are both fast and slow traders in the market. We will denote trading strategies by betas, so beta f, j is the probability that a fast institution of type j decides to buy. Just as usual, we will focus on just one side of the market, uh, so we'll look at the buy side, and everything will be relatively symmetric for the sell side of the market. And here J is one of the types that we just looked at, so one of the four types. Uh, beta SJ will be the probability that the slow trader buys the asset, decides to buy the asset, given their type J. And their type J is one of the two types, so higher low private valuation. Now we can already say something about the very extreme types. So we want to assume, we want to look at equilibria in which there are no, um, sorry, in which trade happens. And like in Gloucester Milgram, we will have an equilibrium in which uh, the spread is prohibitively large, so that no one decides to trade. No, sorry, we did not have that in Gloucester Milgram because there we assume that in uninformed traders would always trade. So, okay, we do not have it there, but we will have such an equilibrium here. But this equilibrium is boring, and we do not want to look at it. So we want to look, we want to get an equilibrium in which uh, trade happens, in which the market is not deadlocked. Uh, so let us look at the most extreme types. The fast traders who know that the uh, asset value is high, who have received good news, and they have high private valuation, they have the highest possible valuation for the asset. So if anyone will buy the asset, it's these guys. So if there is trade in equilibrium in the market, then these types must be buying the asset. Symmetrically, uh, fast traders who have low valuation and they know that the news are bad, that V is low, they have the lowest possible valuation for the asset. Which means that in a kind of a symmetric equilibrium, they will be selling for sure. Right? So they will be not buying. And their beta will be zero. So we have guessed two strategies out of six. We need to find out the, the remaining four. Uh, to characterize the equilibrium, and then uh, you will also need to verify that, you know, 
these strategies that we have guessed are optimal. We will not do that in class, but that's part that you would need to do if you're doing things rigorously. So at this point, we have four strategies left. We do not know what they are, we'll just call them betas. And given these betas, given some betas, some equilibrium betas, we can calculate the equilibrium price. We're looking at the buy side. So the relevant price for us is the ask price that the dealer is quoting. And we compute it in the same way that we did in the Gloss and Milgram model. So this fraction, let me try again, uh, this fraction in the numerator and the same part in the denominator is the probability of receiving a buy order from a fast trader who is the equivalent of the informed trader in our model. And this element in the denominator is the probability of receiving a buy order from an uninformed trader. So the big fraction then is the conditional probability of the trader being informed conditional on the dealer receiving a buy order. So it's the probability that a buy order comes from an informed trader. Again, perfectly same as in Gloucester Milgram model. Uh, just it just takes a little bit more effort to derive uh, these fractions, these probabilities, but not that much. Okay, so we have this ask price. This is the conditional valuation um, of the asset, conditional on receiving a buy order. So this is the price that, that the dealer will quote. How will dealer how how will traders behave? So who will trade? I will leave this question open for the next five minutes because we will take a break right here and um, you can think about it in the meanwhile if you have any questions once again this is the good time to ask them I will see you in five minutes <laughs>